All right, folks, I think we're live. Can everyone give us a quick sound check? Make sure we all sound okay and make sure you can all hear us. Hello, hello. Can anyone hear me? Hi, Scott, you said you were going to wait till later to start singing. <laughs> yeah, it comes out. I don't know. I don't know. Could anyone hear that, though? Uh, say, say yes in the chat box if you can hear me. Say yes. Yes. We're all good. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Claire. Okay, Claire's on. Our savior. She's here. All Thank right. You, people. All right. Great. Let's okay. Perfect. Let's kick it off then. So welcome, folks. Huge welcome to today's live with Scott Barry Kaufman, Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and the Flow Research Collective. So lots of you at this point are familiar now with Dr. Kaufman. The purpose of today's event is to have it be a book launch party for Scott's incredible new book, Transcend, which Stephen is showing you on the screen there. And Dr. Kaufman is going to tell us a hell of a lot more about that, so I'm not even going to get into that now. I don't want to steal his thunder or anything like that. But I do just want to make sure that everyone is aware of Scott and Stephen and has just a little bit of background on, on both of them before we dive in. So Dr. Kaufman is a humanistic psychologist who explores the depths of human potential. He writes the column Beautiful Minds for Scientific American and hosts the Psychology Podcast. Dr. Kaufman has also written many distinguished books. Among these is Transcend, which today is all about, and which we're really, really excited to hear more about. And Scott received a PhD in Cognitive Psychology from Yale University and a, and a Master's of Philosophy and Experimental Psychology from the University of Cambridge. In 2015, he was named one of the 50 groundbreaking scientists who are changing the way we see the world by Business Insider. His accomplishments are too numerous to fully recount here, but it's also worth noting that Scott dances hip hop recreationally, as you may have seen a little bit of the last time, and is classically trained in vocal performance, but unfortunately he was rejected from American Idol not once, but twice. So I want to give Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman a huge warm welcome. We're extremely excited to have him with us today. And for anyone who isn't familiar with Stephen Kotler, we've got Stephen on as well. And I'm sure pretty much everyone must know of at least one of Stephen's 12 books at this point. Stephen's written books like Stealing Fire, Bold, Abundance, The Rise of Superman, he was one of America's most widely published journalists with his work featuring everywhere from Time Magazine to Harvard Business Review to Forbes and The Atlantic Monthly. And Stephen's also the executive director of the Flow Research Collective, which is one of the world's leading research and training institutes for peak performance and flow. So we've got two pretty incredible minds here for you all today. So we're really, really excited to dive in. I'm going to hand it over to Stephen and then presumably to Scott to tell us more about the topic at hand, which is Scott's new book. Hi, everybody. I'm not going to talk much because I want to turn this over to Scott because it's definitely his night. But I want to say that I have watched this book from an inception when I was sworn to silence and couldn't even utter the word Maslow out loud in conjunction with Scott's <laughs> name um, to uh, a lot of struggle along the way. He, uh, he bled for this book in a really, really beautiful way. And I think you can um, you can see it in every page. It's an absolutely astounding book. You should all buy a hundred copies over the course of the event. I think we could put them at the top of the New York Times bestsellers list just by our collective effort. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and one of the just best minds working in psychology today, Scott Barry Kaufman. Well, thanks guys so much. And thanks everyone for joining today. I wanted to talk a little about my background to how I got to this book. I actually started off um, my first book was, was called Ungifted, and I was very interested in understanding who would fall between the cracks in talent. I've really been interested in talent loss my whole career, and I started off with children, school children, and, and what, um, how are we not helping them realize their full potential? And then I moved on to Wired to Create, which is a book about creativity and how creative people don't get uh, full, full recognition in our society, especially in a society that's so focused on linear progression of expertise. And this book in a lot of ways is a synthesis and a culmination 
of everything I've done in my career so far. And I uh, hope to, all of you, help you um, really realize what are the things that are blocking you from reaching your full heights. And some of you may not even know what your full heights are. Uh, most of us, do, no, I don't think anyone knows what their full heights are. Steven, do you know what your full heights are of your potential? I don't. Five, so, 11, five, maybe six feet. Yeah, well, I, I, <laughs> is that your full potential of height? But you have so many other potentialities <laughs> that you could, you can, you, can, you can bring to, I know you're joking, that you can bring to fruition. And I... I realize, you know, I didn't start off in the field realizing that I would end up with this book. Uh, well, I hope this isn't the end. <laughs> I hope I got more books after this, but, <laughs> Please but, God, but that, no. that this book would, would come out. But um, I can now see the thread, which is my, my, deep, um, my deep desire to help all people live a creative, meaningful, and self-actualized life. So self-actualization is where I'm at right now in 2020, and that's my research interest. If it's okay with everyone here, I thought I would uh, do a little bit of a book reading um, of the preface and, and, and hopefully get us all a little bit inspired here and, and forget about the, the uncertainty and anxiety of our lives for even just a few moments. Does that sound good to everyone? Sounds great. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into this. So I'm gonna get in my flow state. So I'm gonna <laughs> be ignoring ignoring the comments. Oh, so post your post your questions, please. While <laughs> Scott's reading, you can you can ask a question by clicking the ask a question button. So let's get all the questions flowing in as, as Scott's reading. Hey son, hey Yeah, reading. Scott, the, the, the chat bar is not fair for a guy with ADD. It's just mean. Yeah, I'm gonna try my best to not look at the chat and, and really get into <laughs> this. Cover that side of the screen. <laughs> I, uh, by the way, I, I, I'll have you all know that I, I read the audiobook, and that was the first book they let me read. So I'm really excited <laughs> about that. I'm really excited nice. that, I, that I got an opportunity to do that. Okay, so you're going to get a little taste of the audiobook right now, but I'm going to actually give you a, even more than, you know, I want to reward you all for coming tonight. So I'm going to put my heart and soul into this. Okay. So you can hear me okay? Is that right? Perfect. Yeah, Okay. you're good. <clears throat> Preface. On June 8, 1970, a warm summer day in Menlo Park, California, Abraham Mazza was furiously writing in his notebook. His mind was full of so many theories and ideas about the higher reaches of human nature, including a theory he had been developing for the past few years, Theory Z. His wife, Bertha, lounged a few steps away by the pool at their home. Glancing at the time on his stopwatch, Mazza begrudgingly realized it was time to do his daily exercise. He was under strict doctor's orders to engage in light exercise to help rebuild his heart. Ever since a heart attack in December 1967, he had experienced frequent chest pains, constantly reminding him of his mortality. He canceled all speaking engagements and even declined to give a prestigious presidential address at the American Psychological Association. Most people are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, with self-actualization depicted at the top of a pyramid. Chances are you learned about it in your introduction to psychology course in college or saw it diagrammed on Facebook, maybe with toilet paper at the bottom. As it's typically presented in psychology textbooks, humans are motivated by increasingly higher levels of needs. The basic needs, physical health, safety, belonging, and esteem must be satisfied to a certain degree before we can fully self-actualize, becoming all that we are uniquely capable of becoming. Some modern day writers have interpreted Maslow's notion of self-actualization as individualistic and selfish. However, a deeper look at Maslow's published and unpublished writings tells a very different story. In an unpublished essay from 1966 called Critique of Self-Actualization Theory, Maslow wrote, it must be stated that self-actualization is not enough. Personal salvation and what is good for the person alone cannot be really good, cannot be really understood in isolation. The good of other people must be invoked, as well as the good for oneself. It is quite clear that a purely intrapsychic, individualistic psychology without reference to other people and social conditions is not adequate. During Maslow's later years, he became increasingly convinced that healthy, that healthy self-realization is actually only a bridge to transcendence. Many of the individuals he selected as self-actualizing people experienced frequent moments of transcendence in which awareness was expanded beyond the self, and many of them were motivated by higher values. At the same time, Maslow observed that these individuals had a deep sense of who they were and what they wanted to contribute to the world. 
This created a deep paradox for Maslow. How could so many of his self-actualizing individuals simultaneously have such a strong identity and actualization of their potential, yet also be so selfless? In a 1961 paper, Maslow observed that self-actualization seems to be a transitional goal, a rite of passage, a step along the path to the transcendence of identity. This is like saying its function is to erase itself. Maslow believed that striving toward self-actualization by developing a strong sense of self and having one's basic needs met was a, crucial, was a crucial step along this path. As he wrote in his 1962 book, Toward a Psychology of Being, quote, self-actualization paradoxically makes more possible the transcendence of self and of self-consciousness and of selfishness, end quote. Maslow observed that self-actualization makes it easier to merge as part of a larger whole. Maslow's lectures, unpublished essays, and private personal journal entries make clear that he became preoccupied with this paradox of transcendence in the last few years of his life. On September 14, 1967, Maslow delivered a riveting lecture at the San Francisco Unitarian Church titled The Farther Reaches of Human Nature. Those who were in attendance remarked that he looked frail and weak as he walked down the aisle to reach the podium at the front of the room. However, once he started speaking, he immediately lit up the room. Quote, and this is, these are Maslow's words now. It is increasingly clear that a philosophical revolution is underway, he began. A comprehensive system is swiftly developing like a fruit tree beginning to bear fruit on every branch. Every field of science and human endeavor is being affected. Referring to the humanistic, humanistic revolution, uh, Maslow explained that humanistic psychology is beginning to unearth the mysteries of real human experiences, needs, goals, and values. This includes our, quote, higher needs, which are also part of the human essence, and include the need for love, for friendship, for dignity, for self-respect, for individuality, and for self-fulfillment. After pausing for a moment, he took a bold next step. If, however, these needs are fulfilled, a different picture emerges, Maslow said. The fully developed and very fortunate human being working under the best conditions tends to be motivated by values which transcends his self. They are not selfish anymore in the old sense of that term. Beauty is not within one's skin, nor is justice or order. One can hardly class these desires as selfish in the sense that my desire for food might be. My satisfaction with achieving or allowing justice is not within my own skin. It does not lie along my arteries. It is equally outside and inside. Therefore, it has transcended the geographical limitations of the self. Maslow was working with great urgency on this idea. Just a few months after his speech, however, he suffered a coronary heart attack, revealing the source of his frailty during his lecture. He survived, but he said he suddenly felt less urgency. This confused him because it seemed to contradict his original, his original theory, in which he argued that physical survival is the most important human need. In a journal entry dated March 28, 1970, he wrote, that's weird that I should be enabled to perceive, accept, and enjoy the eternity and preciousness of the non-me world just because I became aware of my own mortality. The being able to enjoy is puzzling. Instead of falling all the way down to the bottom of his hierarchy, the awareness of his mortality actually heightened his own personal experience of transcendence. Noting a significant shift in values, Maslow observed, the dominance hierarchy, the competitiveness and glory, competitiveness and glory certainly become foolish. There's certainly a shifting of values of what's basic and what's not basic, what's important and what's not important. I think if it were possible for us to die and be resurrected, it might then be possible for more people to have this post-mortem life. In his last major public seminar, just a few months prior to his death, Maslow elaborated. It is quite clear that we are always suffering from this cloud that hangs over us, the fear of death. If you can transcend the fear of death, which is possible, if I could now assure you of a dignified death instead of an undignified one, of a gracious, reconciled, philosophical death, your life today at this moment would change, and the rest of your life would change. Every moment would change. I think we can teach this transcending of the ego. During the last few years of his life, Maslow is working on a series of exercises to transcend the ego and live more regularly in the B realm, the realm of pure being. 
He was also working on a comprehensive psychology and philosophy of human nature and society. In a journal entry dated December 26, 1967, just as he was leaving the hospital after his heart attack, Maslow wrote, new worries about the journals, what to do with them. The way I feel now, I just don't feel up to writing all the things I feel I ought to, the world needs, my duties. Wouldn't mind dying as a result, but I just don't have the stamina to do them. So the thought is save it all in little memos in these journals and the right person someday will come along and know what I mean and why it must be done. On that warm sunny day in Menlo Park on June 8th, 1970, Maslow put down his notepad and with great frustration, he got up to do his daily exercise. He did not want to leave his work even for a second. As he slowly started to jog, his wife Bertha wondered why he seemed to be moving in such an odd way. Just as she was about to ask whether he was all right, Maslow collapsed. By the time she rushed to his side, Maslow was dead at the age of 62, with so much of his work left unrealized. The Good Life. The vision of the good life I present in this book isn't one that is typically touted these days. It's not one where the primary motivation is money, power, social status, or even happiness. Instead, the good life that I present, which is deeply grounded in the core principles of humanistic psychology and a realistic understanding of human needs, is about the healthy expression of needs in the service of discovering and expressing a self that works best for you. The good life is not something you will ever achieve. It's a way of living. As Carl Rogers noted, the good life is a process, not a state of being. It is a direction, not a destination. This process won't always bring feelings of happiness, contentment, and bliss, and may even sometimes cause pain and heartache. It's not for the, quote, faint-hearted, as Rogers notes, as it requires continually stretching outside your comfort zone as you realize more and more of your potentialities and launch yourself, quote, fully into the stream of life. That was a Carl, Rose, Carl Rogers quote. Just like it takes courage to open your sail on a sailboat and see where the winds will take you, it takes a lot of courage to become the best version of yourself. Nevertheless, if you stick with it, you are sure to live a richer life, one that is better characterized by adjectives such as enriching, exciting, rewarding, challenging, creative, meaningful, intense, and awe-inspiring. I believe in the fundamental capacity of humans for growth. No matter your current personality or circumstance, I believe that this book can help you grow in precisely the direction you truly want to grow, in your own style, and in such a way that allows you to show the universe that you really existed and benefited others while you were here. Let's begin the process of becoming. That was awesome. Yeah, that was great, Scott. Yeah, thanks. Good. Great comment. So everyone right can hear me? Yeah, you sounded okay. great. Okay, good. <laughs> Do you mind if I jump in and just start asking yeah. you a bunch of questions myself before we start opening it up for everybody else's comments? Yeah, I thought we mean, yeah, I thought me yeah, and you could probably. actually have, yeah, have a discussion for, you know, a while, you know, before we open it up. And Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, right, I love talking I want, to you. The place I want to, the place I want to start there's two questions I, I'm try, I want to get at. One, the larger one is going to be, because you've just done such an exhaustive overview. I mean, Maslow's at the center, but you have did a really exhaustive overview of the kind of the whole scope of humanistic psychology, which is sort of a forgotten chapter in the history of psychology. And, and, and you argue uh, very, very critical. What I'm curious about is the arc of developmental thought. Like, where do you think humanistic psychology begins? And by the time we're kind of moving out of it in the late 60s, the end of Maslow's life, where do you think it ends up? Okay, great, great question. So I think that one of the first humanistic psychologists, and this may surprise you because a lot of people have not heard of her, but is Karen Horney. So Karen, so you have Freud and Freud says a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> and Karen, <laughs> He, he says a bunch of nonsense about women, about castration, about men and our envy, all these things that are, he's, he's projecting onto others because of his own neuroses. And Karen Horney is a feminist psychoanalyst who comes along in the 30s and says, nah, nah, she's a German psychoanalyst. She, she says, nah, Freud, I don't th you don't know what you're talking about. And she started writing about um, the constructive personality and 
and how humans um, she, I think she's one of the first, you, you know, I, I really do think she's one of the first humanistic psychologists because if, if we consider, you know, psychoanalysis as, as, as the start of psychology in a lot of ways, she was the first psychoanalyst to start to say, I think that we have a lot of potential to change our personality. She really believed in, she has a quote from one of her books that says, personality change can happen up until the day we die, is what she said, or until the time we die. Um, and so I think she was there. And then I think Alfred Adler, who was another uh, psychoanalyst, was also a humanistic psychologist. And Alfred Adler really believed in, he, he had a word called Gestukamumful, which is German for, <laughs> it's, it's, if we have any German speakers in the room, I, I apologize Gesundheit. if yeah. I mispronounced that. I, I did pronounce it correct for the audiobook. It was something like that. Um, and, and that word means social interest. It means we, we don't only, because Freud emphasized the the will to aggression, you know, the, the aggressive instincts and the sexual instincts. And, and Alfred Adler was one of the first to come along and say, nah, Freud, nah, I think we actually have social uh, care and social concern. And that's not the same thing as, as that can be reduced to sex drive or, or, or aggression drive. And so I think those two, 30s, 40s, um, they did a lot of work. And Carl Jung, I would also say, was one of the first mm -hmm. humanistic psychologists, even though a lot of people don't give him credit for that. Carl Jung, for sure. And Carl Jung's uh, interest in the spiritual domain realm of, and intuition, you know, he really believed in the spiritual intuition as is important to study. And 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 if you actually want to talk about even before then, we could talk about like the existential philosophers really influenced modern day humanistic psychology a lot as well. And even if you want to go back even further, I would say the the Buddhists, uh, you know, the Buddha himself, but also all the Eastern ph ph Eastern philosophy and taught and uh, a lot of Zen Buddhism really influenced it. So all of that I think laid a good groundwork for Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, Eric Fromm, Carl uh, uh, Roel May to come along and start the humanistic revolution. And what I want us to do by the end of tonight is I want us to launch the humanistic revolution for the first time in 75 years. It died 75 years ago, and I want this to be the official christening of the humanistic revolution for the 21st century. You guys heard it here first. <laughs> um, let me ask you another question, sort of related, because um, it's one of, the, one of the things I love about uh, this work and, and sort of your work in general, it's got a great history of science vibe. And I love tracking the progression of ideas. I think it, I think it really helps me understand them when I understand, okay, this is the question people started with. This was the next question. This was the next question. I love thinking about that way. And you, you spend a little bit of time talking about the massive influence of anthropology on Maslow, which most people have ever even know about, um, so can you, would you just kind of go over that and talk about how you think that ends up impacting his work over the years? Oh, absolutely. He, Maslow started off in, in, in college. He was, he was captivated by anthropology and sociology before he got captivated with psychology. He was captivated with anthropology. He joined his college anthropology club. Um, I think he might've been president of the club. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, he, he read a lot of the works. He was obsessed with Margaret Mead's work, Bronislaw Malazowski, Ruth Benedict, and Ralph Linton. In fact, his wife Bertha um, was a student of Ralph Linton's in college. Um, so those were some seminal anthropologists from that time period, um, seminal you know, for anthropology as a whole. And it's interesting because when he started off, he really took the position um, and the sociological position at the time that we were all born lumps of clay to be molded by society, that it was there was no no such thing as an innate human nature, that it's all society that that does it. His his influences he really changed when he worked with the Black Blackfoot Indians, um, which is a reserve in uh, in Canada. He had a summer anthropo anthropological gig, gig there early in his career. He spent the whole summer with the uh, with with, um, with with the Blackfoot, the Blackfeet, and and he really was changed by that experience he loved them by the way and he really he, he says he owes a huge debt to them um and and what he learned and discovered he wrote this in a, in a paper after after in a report after his anthropological um uh, summer time there he wrote you know i used to think that we were all just born lumps of clay and that it was entirely society 
But the more I hung out with the, the Blackfoot Indians, the more I realized there's a core essence to humanity that I could, I could still, even no matter how different their culture was, there was still things we could connect on, a common humanity. And that really, really interested him. And he started around that time to start formulating, he said, I, I'm starting to formulate a natural personality theory, um, that there's a, a natural personality. This is, this is a precursor to eventually his, his positing of, of basic human needs that we all share, but, this, but you could see the seeds in it in his report. That's a really good place to go next. Um, talk about the origin story of his theory of needs. Um, a little bit where, where it came from, and then I'm going to ask you to talk a little about your sort of reinterpretation of the pyramid. Sure. Well, his theory of needs was influenced by so many different sources. So you have the Blackfoot Indians, but you also have um, the anthropological uh, work. Um, you have, uh, he did work with monkeys, um, and he was really, really um, influenced by Alfred Adler, who I mentioned earlier. Alfred Adler posited we have the will to uh, for social interest, but we also have the will to power. And he was trying to find that power drive in, in animals that he studied, in, in the monkeys he studied. In fact, Maslow was so excited, uh, his hero was Alfred Adler at the time. And Alfred Adler emigrated from Germany around Nazi Germany time, came to America the same year, 1937, that Maslow came to New York City to do a postdoc at Columbia with Thorndike. And he found out that Alfred Adler was hosting uh, private uh, discussions in his hotel suite at the Gramer Gramercy Hotel. So Maslow attended that and, and, and said to Alfred Adler, you know, you're my hero. And they became good friends, but their friendship turned sour. And there's a couple of hairy moments in their friendship. Um, I hope you enjoy this story. I'm not digressing too much, but I, and I think it adds a little humanity to these yeah. two legends. So I, I loved reading um, in, 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 I really, dug deep to find all this stuff. But I, I found that um, one time Ma uh, Mazza was was having lunch with Adler at the Gramercy, Gramercy Park, uh, you know, diner or whatever, the you know, the restaurant at lunch. And he suggested something like that he was a disciple of Freud. Like, how did you like being the disciple of Freud? And Adler turned, changed his whole persona, threw his fist down on the table and said, I am not anyone's disciple. Basically, he's saying I was not Freud's bitch, <laughs> and and it really shocked Maslow. This was his hero, and he didn't mean to upset his hero. And then another instance, he was. It, it, the, this is the last time he ever saw Adler, and he really deeply regrets this meeting. But he was in in Adler's uh, um, apartment at one of the meetings, and and Maslow just disagreed with one of the things Adler said. And apparently, Adler threw Maslow against the wall and said, <laughs> are, "Are you with me, or are you not with me?" <laughs> and, and 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 Maslow said that's the last time he ever he ever saw. Uh, Adwar, actually, just a couple months later, uh, Adwar died of a heart attack in a, t a talk in Ireland. And Maslow wrote in, a, in, a, in one of his writings, I'm deeply regretful I never uh, repaired that relationship. So anyway, that's a, an interesting story. That, like, if you want to know some inside baseball about, about that. But um, so he was influenced by, thank you for letting me go on that detour. So he was, he was influenced by Adwar. And the need, so the need for esteem came from, we can say, we can trace that to Adwar's need for power. Right. Um, the need for connection, we can trace to his mentors um, uh, who did the work on the rhesus monkeys. Uh, what's his name? The, the very famous, uh, when he was in, in yeah, grad school. Pre-Adler? Yeah, no, no, it was after Adler. It was his, it was his, well, it was, it was the Harlow? same time. Oh, Har yeah, ha Harry Harlow, Harry Harlow. Harlow. So the, he got- The great ha torturer of animals. Yes, yes, Harry Harlow. So he, he was Harlow's grad student at Wisconsin. Uh, so around the same, this is actually around the same time that that interaction happened, uh, but right before Maslow moved to New York after that. But anyway, so he got the need for love and connection from has, from, 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 from him, uh, Harlow. And I think he got the need for self-actualization from Kurt Goldstein, who I looked, I looked oh. up the Kurt Goldstein's book, um, the, uh, the organism, I think it's called something like that. And I did a control F self word, self-actualization, cause this was published way before math. And, and I found the passage, which I, 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 I didn't publish in the book, but I, I, um, 
what, basically the passage is something like like this. He said, he, I've been studying all my brain damaged patients and I've noticed that we have this sort of will, even in the most brain damaged patients to self actualize our brain, ourselves, our brain. We want to desperately become all we're capable of becoming. And we even reuse material that um, has uh, that has not been in use for that purpose, just so that we can do everything we can to be resilient. And Maslow, um, in his motivation of personality paper, um, has a has a throwaway line where he says, um, "And now the need for self actualization, a term I I um, I take a cue from Kurt from Kurt Goldstein." And so he got that from Kurt Goldstein, but it wasn't exactly what Kurt Goldstein meant by it. Maslow made it something bigger and broader that had to do with something beyond the brain. Um, talk to me about, um, if you were to define theory Z, would you define it strictly as like a theory of B values? Would you give it a, a bigger context? Do you think he ever finally realized it? Um, I just like saying theory Z, by the way. Yeah. Theory Z is is it, no one's heard of theory z right it's like no one's heard of that and people i don't know if people have heard of douglas mcgregor's work theory x and theory y so douglas mcgregor has a very influential theory in management called theory x and theory y so theory x is being uh, motivated by carrot stick rewards Theory Y is being motivated by um, by intrinsic love for what you're doing. Well, that's where Theory Z, Maslow said, you know what? That's fine. You know, I think there are different types of self actualizers, and he had this insight at the very end of his life. He said there are there are those who are using their capabilities in a Theory Y way. They love what they're doing and they're actualizing themselves, and that's fine and good. But he said, I think there we need to posit a Theory Z of a certain type of self-actualizer who is a transcender. And that's a self-actualizer that isn't merely content just actualizing their potentials, but they will, they will never rest until they fully help actualize everyone else's potentials. And that's what he also has been called the Bodhisattva path to enlightenment. He was very, very interested in, in that path to enlightenment. So he was very influenced by the, by the Buddhist uh, notions there of um, you can't reach heaven or enlightenment until you are here and help others in, become enlightened, right? And so that's what he really posited Theory Z. It was actually an extension of Douglas McGregor's seminal uh, organizational management work. Hmm. It's, it's the difference between passion right passion um well it's an amazing motivator and very 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 powerful it's very self-obsessed and all-consuming and purpose meaning an externally focused uh thing seems to spread that out and also you know in what in what we've learned in you know the past 30 years in positive psychology seems to provide kind of a more lasting durable happiness and meaning um it's act it actually it, it actually uh, works where sometimes passion gets really unstable. Yeah, Basil actually saw Theory Z as being a state of consciousness that is beyond health and happiness. So at the highest level of human consciousness, you have what's called dichotomy transcendence. A lot of things that, uh, a lot of words we use, a lot of dichotomies we use just don't make sense anymore at that level of consciousness. And I'll give you some examples. One is the word selfishness. So what does it mean to be selfish when what is good for you is simultaneously good for the world. You, by being, your being in the world, like, you know, is, 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 you're enjoying it, but others enjoy it too. So then what does the word selfish mean in that context? And that he went right down the list. He went down the list of all the false dichotomies that non, non, non-transcenders love to do, you know, um, evil versus good. You know, pe people love all these dichotomies. Uh, in, at a higher level, we integrate the the darkness within us. It becomes part of the unity. There's, it doesn't make sense to separate that from from other sides of ourselves. Um, anyway, he he went right down the list. Um, he argued that at the highest level, 
of cognition, we're, va we're motivated by the B values, the values of being itself. And what that means is we're motivated by values where we don't want to, um, to we're not motivated, motivated by these values because of anything else, because we want to get anywhere else. In and of itself, they excite us. They're, the, they're an end goal in itself. So he has a whole list of B values from meaningfulness to justice, to truth, truth seeking, to beauty in the world, to meaningfulness, to perfection, to uh, individuality. He has a whole list of these B values. And he argues something. I really like this. Okay, stay with me here. He argues there's something called meta grumbles. One of my favorite concepts that no one's ever heard of. Meta grumbles. All the, all, by the way, all these concepts today are all my favorite concepts no one's ever heard of. Meta grumbles. So he argues he, he argued where, that people who are at theory Z level are meta motivated. So they're not motivated by basic needs. They're motivated by their higher needs. But they also are, might be prone to not being happy. They might be prone to meta grumbles. Let me explain. So most people um, who are motivated by their basic needs will grumble about a deprivation of their basic needs. So if they're hungry, everywhere they look, if they're severely hungry, everywhere they look, everyone, everyone looks like a cheeseburger to them. Or if you're a vegetarian, everything looks like broccoli to you, right? Okay, okay, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, okay? And you're grumbling that, that there's not enough broccoli. Um, if you're severely deprived of social connections, everywhere you look, you're grumbling about, uh, please love me, please like me, accept me. If you're severely deprived of esteem, well, you demand respect from others. You try to impart the world to suit your own goals. You know, you say, respect me, you know, um, uh, I, I am entitled to respect. But at the higher level of theory Z, when you're motivated by the B values, your grumbles take a different form. What, can you notice a difference between the kinds of grumbles of, oh, I'm hungry, no one loves me, and, and I'm getting the respect, and the kind of grumbles of, there's just not enough beauty in the world. I need to put more beauty in the world. Oh, there's just not enough meaningfulness. I need to infuse more meaningfulness. Oh, there's not enough um, uh, justice. Uh, th that is a horrible injustice over there. I'm going to spend my whole life fighting that injustice. It, we're not talking about happiness. At the level of theory Z, you're beyond happiness at that level. It is a good thing to have meta grumbles. We want more people to have meta grumbles in the world. Eric Fromm um, argues in his book, The Sane Society, that to be sane and be to be happy in an insane society is the highest uh, marker of insanity, <laughs> right? So we have to move beyond happiness at this highest level, and we need to fight for the right things in life um, and, and, and get outside of ourselves. So does that notion of meta grumbles make sense to everyone? Yeah, it's cool. People are loving that idea, Scott, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Claire, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. You spelled it right. Meta grumbles. Uh, do you mind if I interrupt for one sec with a simple question? No, jump in there, Ryan. Um, yeah, please. Firstly, I just want to mention to everyone now that we've got more folks on that you can order Scott's book by literally just clicking that green shiny button right in the middle of the screen there. It'll bring you to a page where you can get the, the audio book or the hardback or the paperback uh, right away. So encourage folks to do that and then grab some copies for your friends as well, share with them. But the, the question is literally just what is humanistic psychology? And then as a follow-on to that, what what is self-actualization simply defined, given that they're the two big kind of elements we're talking about? Well, humanistic psychology is at, at its base, interested in understanding the whole person. It's as simple as that and as complex as that. And what does that mean to understand the whole person? Well, the humanistic psychologists were not terribly concerned with studying the happiness or, um, or high performance or achievement or all these buzzwords that psychologists, modern day psychologists seem to love. They didn't, that wasn't part of their lexicon. Their lexicon was a bit different. Their lexicon included words such as freedom, responsibility, creativity, spirituality, social action, uh, health, growth, growth. There's a word, you know, which uh, 
I don't know if you hear the word growth as much as you hear the word happiness these days. So they had a different lexicon. And what and the whole point of all those things they're interested in is how can we become an integrated whole human being? In a lot of ways, self-actualization is what is that part of you that is unique to you that if fully realized will make the biggest impact on the world. You know, when Maslow's basic needs are things that we share with others. So the need for connection, the need for self-esteem, the need for safety, our evolutionarily evolved instincts and needs that we all can rally around. But Maslow saw self-actualization as that sacred part of you that no one else can replicate. What is that? Find, find the sacredness of you and actualize the beep out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I got to do a, a quick inter, interrupt yeah, yeah, no, go, 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 this, go. It's on this theme. I want to know, because um, this book has been a journey for you. I want to know how you've changed. You went and lived inside Maslow's life for five, six years. How are you different? Can I just read a quote real quick uh, from an unpublished uh, essay Maslow wrote? Uh, this is what he said about self-actualization. We try to make a rose into a good rose rather than seek to change roses into lilies. It necessitates a pleasure in the self-actualization of a person who may be quite different from yourself. It even implies an ultimate respect and acknowledgement of the sacredness and uniqueness of each kind of person. I just love that quote. I wanted to read it. Um, so my, my journey has been insane. Uh, for this book, it is it's such a it, it, it was such a deeply personal journey for me that I felt uh, on a mission. Do you do you remember in that uh, the uh, the preface that I read about his personal journal at the end, where he said, "Hopefully, someone will come along someday and and yeah, know what must be." Clearly, he's writing to you. No, <laughs> that would be the most narcissistic thing in the world for me to say that he was writing to no, me. No, I'm saying it clearly. He's writing it for you. You were the guy that came along and you picked it up. He, well, okay, next. So I there 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 are other humanistic psychologists that exist in the world. I want to give them credit. Like Kirk Schneider wrote edited the human the, the humanistic psychology handbook. So this day and age, there still there exists humanistic psychologists. But I did uh, when I found that in his journal. Um, I don't know if anyone else had ever read that part of his. I mean, I, I actually in part of my journey was taking off and reading two, his two set personal journals that was over a thousand pages. So I learned more about this man than I think I know about anyone else in my life. Maybe I know about myself. And, and when I got to that part, I said, I did feel a great calling, I should say, um, to, to, to realize, to realize this. And, and also I just resonated so much with the notion of self-actualization. You know, when I read, uh, when I wrote my first book on gifted intelligence redefined, and it was all about my, my theory of intelligence in that book. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you my definition of my theory of intelligence it is that in, intelligence is the dynamic interplay of engagement and ability in pursuit of personal goals. Now that's a mouthful, but I just want you to know that I, developed that definition of intelligence before I read any Maslow, before I read any humanistic psychology. And this is back in the day. It's kind of interesting for me to see that there was a seed within me that yeah. that's what I really wanted to study. I didn't even care about intelligence. I thought that's what I cared about. I, what I actually, I wrote a whole book on intelligence and only now do I realize I actually wrote a whole book on self-actualization. For children, for for helping kids self-actualize, right. I didn't real I didn't totally. realize it at the time. I can't explain why we have certain seeds within us, but I think that's part of the point here. Is all of us, every single person in this room, you two, have certain seeds that you were born with, and and sometimes it takes what Matt, what Howard Gardner calls a crystallizing experience for you to realize mm -hmm. it. Uh, some ex thing where you resonate and maybe you don't have a fully fleshed out idea, but you just know, Oh, that's me. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. That's how I felt in this journey. Talk to me about the, um, one, I, I, I want to track kind of the work cause you, you worked and you, I still think of you. Maybe we need to change the category. I put Scott Barry Goffman in, um, but I still think of you as foundationally, um, you know, one of our keenest thinkers about creativity. 
which is not Maslow's core subject, but it seems to play a big role in how he thinks about the world and what it is required for self-actualization. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sorry, what was the specific question, Stephen? The, the, the role that creativity plays in self-actualization and how uh, your middle work ties with, with Maslow. So Mas in, a, in, a, um, in a, one of Maslow's last published writings was a book chapter on creativity in society. Um, I can find out what that is. It was called Creativity and Civilization. Again, it's, it's so hard to find. Oh, wow. I, was so, I was so excited when I found it. Um, it's on my bookshelf back in New York or else I'd read it, I'd read it to you all. I'm, I'm, in, L, I'm, I'm, I'm in LA right now and, and I'll be here for a while, but I was um, read the book chapter and in the book chapter, she said, you know, I've come to the conclusion that what I've been thinking of self actually is really creativity. I think they're synonymous. So, so he wrote that in, uh, in 1970, I think he was even writing the, like doing the proofs of that book chapter, like right, right up to the day. You know that he passed away. Um, so he really believed that creativity. Um, but I'm getting distracted by the comments. By the way, if anyone could actually find that book on Amazon, the Creativity Civilization, something like that from the '60s, uh, Maslow had a book chapter. If anyone can do that detective work, I'll, I'll be very impressed. <laughs> Maybe they'll even get a free copy of Transcend if they could find that link. But uh, creativity, he believed. He, see, he did view it self actualization as that thing that's individually. You know, what is the thing, what is the individual potentiality within you that is most likely um, to, to really add unique value to the world? And, 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 and that's also consistent with Roald May's thinking about creativity. Roald May was also a humanistic psychologist. Mm -hmm. I, my dad, actually, who's somewhere here listening, I, I think, I hope. Uh, he, he, oh, yeah, he they're, uh, Mr. Mrs. Kaufman, you did good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. My dad um, had told me he used to read Roll May all the time in psychology today when he was growing up. He used to ask me, do you know Roll May? I've never heard of Roll May. Now I'm like such a big fan of Roll May. But Roll May wrote a beautiful book called The Courage to Create. One of the, I think, maybe the best book ever written on creativity. And in The Courage to Create, uh, Roald May just simply defines creativity as just bringing into existence something that didn't exist before. It's such a simple, simple definition. You know, creativity researchers bend out over backwards, come up with a precise definition of creativity, and they argue it, and then no one cares. No one's, you know, they go to conferences, they argue <laughs> about it. No one's, you know, like no one's, no one cares about the all these debates. You know. Like we just, what we need is just a definition that that we could just hop right on board. The every every person can just hop right on board and just start creating. And I love that. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you yeah. think it would be psychology if we agreed? Like you turn the field <laughs> upside down. <laughs> no, 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 um, <laughs> no. Well, it, we need. We all need things to disagree about. We all need challenges <laughs> in life, or else we'll be bored. That's why a lot of people um, are really. I mean, a lot of people are, are anyway, I wouldn't get into the whole Corona thing, but anyway, uh, we, we all need Please. our mountain to climb. Talk to me for a second. Um, cause you did a lot of work on this, um, in the middle of the book, you do a chunk on dark triads and light triads, which you've done a lot of original research kind of into that idea. So why don't you give us foundation in dark triads, light triads, tie it into Maslow and, and, and talk to me about some of the work that you've done and where it's going next also. Yeah, I'm, I've been doing a bunch of research. That's that's actually my main research topic right now. And we're actually just about to get another publication on that. Um, and nice. I'll tell you those results. Um, some of the results are a little bit controversial. So I don't know if I'm allowed to be contra controversial, but okay. So let me just tell you, uh, the dark triad has been studied for 30, 40 years. So a lot of people have heard of psychopaths. Um, you've heard the term psychopath. The term psychopath in the, was was mostly just in the clinical literature up until about 40 years ago. Some psychologists came around and said, "Well, I wonder if there's psychopaths among us. Like, like, could we measure, you know, it is a personality trait and and see where all where everyone in the society who's not in a clinical population may score on it?" And they created a, a scale of the dark triad, which measures psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. They found all three of those traits correlated very strongly with each other. So people who tend to be narcissistic tend to also be psychopathic 
and they also tend to be very manipulative. And that's been studied to death. That topic has been studied for 40 years. I was fed up. I, I was at the, working at the Positive Psychology Center with Martin Seligman, who's the founder of Modern Day Positive Psychology. We were running, we were working together on the Imagination Institute. Uh, that actually might be something in, of interest to a lot of the people here as well. Uh, the work we did with the Imagination Institute, you go to imagination-institute.org if you want to see what all the projects we did there. But when I was at Penn, I went into my office, the office of one of my colleague, David Yadins, who he's a great, great, re, uh, he was a grad student of Martin Seligman. Now he's doing a postdoc at Hopkins on, on LSD and transcendence. He's, he's awesome. Oh, in I, Roland's lab. That's he, great. He just joined Roland's lab. And David Yadin, one of my favorite psychologists, uh, one of my best friends, um, he, I w go in his office and I sit down exasperated and I say, what is it about people, the dark side? Why is it so seductive to people? Is there anything interesting about people who aren't assholes? That was my question. <laughs> that was my question. And David response was, wait, what's the dark triad? That sounds interesting. And I said, no, no, <laughs> you just proved my point. <laughs> so I explained to the dark triad literature because he hadn't heard of that literature. And then um, I, I, he said, send me some papers on it. And I sent him papers. And then I get an email from him. And all the email said was white triad question mark. And I almost fell off my chair. I was like, is there such a thing? I responded, is there such a thing? He said, no, I was just joking, man. And I said, don't, you don't joke to SP, the notorious SBK. We're going to do the study. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't, you don't joke about something like that. It's so, you know, how, you know, you, you don't, you don't joke like triad that we're going to, we're going to turn this, we're going to, we're going to create a new field. We're going to do this because why not? Life is short. And um, so I, I, uh, my research coordinator, uh, Lizzie Hyde, Elizabeth Hyde, who um, was in the office as well, when I, I, I turned my seat, you know, where she, we shared the same office. And I said, do you want to study the white triad with us? And she's like, sure. So we just, all three of us, we just started brainstorming. What could, what could the everyday saint look like? Because everyone had been studying the everyday psychop psych psychopath for 40 years. So we were wondering, could we create a scale of the everyday saint? And what the everyday saint is, we're not talking about the Mother Teresa. Just like the dark triad is not talking about the Jeffrey Dahmer. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? We wanted the counterpart, which was who was the person who just by their being in the world lights everyone up? That's all we were interested in as a personality, not as something you do. You know, there's a lot of people who are, will say all the things they do. You know, look, I'm amazing. I look at this nonprofit I have. Look at this. They virtue signal up the kazoo. But they might be horrible people. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? So we wanted to really look at, like, the being of a person. So we we spent three, four years on this research project. We published it uh, in Frontiers in Psychology, uh, a three-study paper um, on a first draft of a light triad. And do you want to do you want to know what the, the three three factors of the light triad are? Yes, I like okay. your AI Machiavellian. I like I, I love where you went with that. Yeah. So we the the opposite of Machiavellian is Kantianism. All my nerds out there will get it. Yeah. Categor <laughs> categorical oh imperative the, fir the first categorical imperative who's with me i'm just gonna wait who's with me first categorical imperative <laughs> see art art yeah, and hope cunningham yeah, art and Ho art and hope cunningham they know exactly what i'm talking about yeah. and and that's I do too. thou shall not treat people as a means to an end only an end into themselves see people who are machiavellian i don't know if you've ever been around someone who's machiavellian and you can tell if, if you know the signs to look out for you know they're just scheming like it's like they never turn it off. It's like just like, you just want to say to them, just just chill for a second. Like you don't have to get anything out of me right now. Like it's okay. Like, <laughs> exactly. You, you'll, you'll be exactly. fine if for exactly. five exactly. minutes you don't extract my soul. Like you'll be fine. Exactly. I swear. Exactly. If you're if oh. you just be if you just be for five minutes, I guarantee that you'll be able to handle it. So anyway, so we wanted to study the opposite. Who were those who were Contius, they uh, really just admired others. It's what Maslow called be love, love for the being of yep. others. Um, uh, and we wanted to study the, what are be loving people like. So that was one factor we measured. The other factor was humanism, which was seeing the best in uh, our humanism was uh, treating every individual uh, with dignity and respect as having inherent worth as a human being, regardless of their ideology, you know, their religion, their 
politics, etc. Um, and the third one is faith in humanity. Faith in humanity is, um, I believe that humans are basically good. I know that we're flawed. Humans are flawed. I'm not, I don't deny that. But I think at the end of the day, humans are basically good. And I think that is exemplified by, um, um, uh, uh, who was it? Who uh, was in the, uh, the Nazi, she wrote the journals. Uh, Anne Frank. Anne Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Frank. I'm not sure she wrote the turtles. <laughs> okay. I'm, I am horrified that I forgot Anne Frank's name. Please write the studio. Well, that is the second day of Passover. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, there are a lot of very Thank you, Courtney happy. Turner. Okay, let's let's focus. Anne Frank, I think exemplified by Anne Frank's, you know, when she wrote when the Nazis were coming up. I mean, up to the day that they're, they're coming up to kill her, she still was writing in her journals, I believe in spite of everything that humans are basically good. She wrote that in her journal. That exemplifies the light triad spirit. And I'm going to tell you who, who exemplifies the dark triad spirit. Um, and look, I'm going to equal opportunity, forget the psychopaths and, and the everyday saints. What's his name? He um, Charades. Should we play charades? Um, Charlie Manson. No. Um, uh, he, there was a there was a Netflix special about him out recently, and women were saying they're attracted to him, and it was horrible. And oh, Netflix Dom, had you're a, talking about Dom. You're talking about Dom, or no, 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 no. He's handsome, apparently. Ted Bundy. I, Ted I, Bundy. I, I Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Yeah. Ted Bundy. I, I, I'm not. Uh, That's right. Danielle Fortran is right. Ted Bundy. Not Joe Exotic, not Joe Exotic. <laughs> so, uh, Joe so, Exotic. So, so, so that's what someone wrote. And, in by, the, and by the way, the tie. The, yeah, Katie Science got it. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Sign by the yeah. way. Hi, Katie. So, ten, Ted Bundy wrote, "What's le one less person on the earth anyway?" So you couldn't be more different. I, be, I believe both those quotes really exemplify the light versus the dark triad. What's one less person on the earth anyway? And I believe at the end of the day, despite it all, humans are basically good. It's very profound. Have you looked me. at this? Is a kind of super geek, geeky question, and something like Robert Cloninger's self transcendent scales. Have you looked at how the light triad maps against something, th those kinds of personality assessments that kind of factor in, you know, what he was talking about as spiritual values and things like that? Sorry, I didn't hear anything you said because Amethyst Henderson said something that is going to make me cry. They said, I already had a crying session in the beginning with the reading. What? What greater validation is there for 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 uh, devoting five years of your life to a project than that? So I just want to say thank you so much, Amethyst, for saying that. Thanks, Amethyst. Thanks, Amethyst. Thanks, that was Amethyst sweet. Amethyst in uh, Chicago in July. Stephen and I did. So thanks, Amethyst. Thank you. So can you ask your question again? I'm sorry. I'm going to try my best not to look at this chat section session. <laughs> <laughs> Come. Come. I want to know if you've looked at the light triad in respect to something like Robert Cloninger's self-transcendent scale. Yes, Over here. absolutely. Focus here, buddy. <laughs> right here. Keep it here. <laughs> I'm still on the Anne Frank uh, gaff. I know you are. <laughs> because it's it's really it's really like, you know, I was playing charades with you when I was like Nazi's basement. <laughs> anyway, that I mean that was classic me and you, right? That was classic like our friendship. That is classic me and you. Know? Okay. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm going to try to focus. So yes, I did study uh, Conninger's work very much. By the way, this t this T-shirt is way too tight on me, and I can't breathe. But I wore it for you all because it's my favorite color. Okay. So um, you a few buttons, yeah. What do you say? Did it's I open paisley. Buttons? Is paisley so, a color? This shirt Blue doesn't fit color. me. It doesn't fit me, but it's it. it I love the color so much. I love it. It does. Okay. Uh, if you could do me, maybe the, like the opening of Purple Rain for us would be good. Would that hurt? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what that means. But I will Prince? say, oh, okay, okay, the Prince song, yeah. So Cloninger's work was very relevant, but we so we looked into all the scales. Um, you know, we looked at all the scales in order to come up with uh, something mm -hmm. unique because you can't get away. You can't get a period publication in Frontiers if you you know, just say, oh, we create a new skill. <laughs> right, like, exactly. You know. So we really wanted to create something. We really wanted to do this right. 
So we looked in the Condor scale. Now, Condor scales, uh, no offense to Condor, I was not incredibly impressed because it, he was he was arguing it's a measure of self transcendence, but the the facets were it didn't it didn't feel to us like it got at the be love aspect of what Maslow was talking about. This aspect of love for the being of others. There was where was that in the scale? I th that's interesting. Um, I got to grab my clavicle. It's behind me. Um, it's interesting because there's a value in there's there's something in uh, in one of his values that it was like a self transcend one of his self transcendent values that is about purpose. It goes beyond self and starts get to get getting to some of the B values and B love. But it brings me to another question, which I wanted you to talk about, which is. Um, a point you make in the book, which I think is really interesting, I think it's kind of true, which is that psychology, when we talk, when psychology thinks about love, it often talks about love in terms of its absence. Mm. And it doesn't really think about its presence and, and, and that we talk about, we talk about detriment and what's missing, but we don't talk about what happens once it's there. And I thought that was a really interesting point you made in Transcend. That the, the absence of darkness, what, well, the absence of love is how psychology often talks about love, right? When it's missing oh, from your life, right? That's right. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but there's much less about what happens when your life is filled with it. Yeah, it's so true. And and that's, well, to give Martin Seligman some credit, when he started modern day positive psychology, he felt like the field of psychology was so interested in bringing us from like negative 20 to zero, not looking from what's above zero, you know? Um, and that frustrated Maslow as well. That frustrated um, a lot of the humanistic psychologists, including Viktor Frankl, you know, talked a lot about that. He says, he has a great quote. He has a great quote. Can I find it? Can I find it? Uh, it's something like, it's something like, we don't, we don't live or die by our. Oh, what, it's what your party, doing? man. You can, you can, you can find any quote you want. It's, it's my party. I can self-actualize if I want to. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Um, uh, man's search for meaning is a primary force in his life. There are some authors who contend that meanings and values are, quote, nothing but defense mechanisms, reaction formations, and sublimations. But as for myself, I would not be willing to live merely for the sake of my defense mechanisms, nor would I be ready to, ready to die merely for the sake of my reaction formations. Man, however, is able to live and even to die for the sake of his ideals and values. Isn't that beautiful? That's really beautiful. This comes from a guy who lived for the concentration camp. He, he was with the, you know, he was with the Nazis. Rian, you were going to ask a question and I cut you off earlier. So I'm now tossing the mic over to you to finish your question. <laughs> All righty. We, we got lots, Scott. You cool if I just start throwing some at you? Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, first one that I think is really interesting is how to create an individual roadmap for transcendence. Or is it more of a one-fits-all solution? And I know obviously you've kind of touched up a bit to that, but... Curious to hear your thoughts on. <laughs> yes, <I am. laughs> because look, my friend, my friend Todd wrote something in the chat box, and I'm getting excited. I'm like, oh my god, Todd's here! So I need to listen to you, and I'm gonna put my <laughs> hand up. I'm gonna block, block the wait. That didn't block the screen. <laughs> didn't block the screen. <laughs> can you, can you please do it again? Yes, we'll, we'll get you. you Scott, you go, by the way, if you go full screen, the chats will get cut off. But I kind of like the chat think... too. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you, how do you create create an individual roadmap for transcendence, or is it more of a one size fits all solution? So it's definitely there. There definitely is no roadmap. It's it's funny. I saw in the publicity pr pr materials for this. It said roadmap, and I, I was. No, I was like, I wouldn't have framed it <laughs> because, um, uh, uh, be just simply because I, the whole point of, of this book, as I read in The Good Life, is you have to find what's right for you. I think there's so many triggers for transcendence that are on offer in this world. 
and and people have different triggers. Um, and you have to find your triggers and try to create your life as much as possible around those. That's actually what the transcenders that Maslow described do. They 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 create jobs and and only take jobs that allow them to maximize their peak experiences. And that's an intentional part of what they, of why they do what they do. And, and also the idea between work and play is a false dichotomy among transcenders. That's something that um, becomes, uh, an, again, dichotomy transcendence. We talked earlier about some other forms of dichotomy transcendence. The work play one is a big one. The self world one is a big one. So transcendence is, as I see it, and I have a definition of transcendence in the book as the harmonious integration of the whole self in the service of the good society. So I talk about healthy tr transcendence versus unhealthy transcendence. A lot of people are shooting for unhealthy transcendence in the world today. They may uh, join some cult or some spiritual group hoping that it'll satisfy their deep need for connection or some of the deficiencies within themselves. And they find out it, it doesn't because they have not taken uh, care of their deficiencies. So they're transcending on a faulty foundation in terms of a hierarchy of needs. Well, mm -hmm. healthy transcendence is something we can all strive toward in our own style. This is a thing Maslow talked about. He said self-actualization is about finding that sacredness within you um, and, and, and actualizing it in your own style. And that's really what he meant by self-actualization. And then transcendence, we need to do in our own style as well. To force someone to go on a silent meditation retreat and then, and then it, it didn't work for them or, or, or they, even some people, you know, there's, there's a, a, a research literature showing a, a 10, 20, you know, 15% of people who do meditation actually it activates some of their post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we don't, you know, we talk about these things as though they're going to be panaceas for everyone. And I think that that's very dangerous. You know, I think it's, I think it's, I think actually a lot of gurus are very dangerous. <laughs> Sorry if that was the very controversial thing to say, but you know, I'm not a guru, right? I, I am a scientist who's trying to show on offer what are all the ways um, that scientifically can probabilistically make you live a more fulfilling life in, um, in, in, in your own style. Um, and I can just show you the, the probabilities because you would want to know that is a doc, you know, if you go to a doctor's office and you say, and they say, well, your cholesterol is very, very high. Well, you want to know the science. You want to know, well, what are the scientific things I can do that can increase the chances that I'll lower my cholesterol? You don't just say, okay, well, here's a nice book that I read by by you know Guru Babuga whatever <laughs> whatever name that that that, uh, that 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 he he made he he went on a mountain he went on a mountain and he came up he came up with some uh, God told him how to lower your cholesterol you wouldn't you, you would you would you trust that would you to to save your life you know wait that happened to him too I I that, I was I just had that experience last night the bush started burning and the voice came and it told me to lay off the fried food. It's very weird. I want to say something though before I alienated half of my audience. I do think uh, there are some wonderful gurus out there, and I also want to say that I think there's a lot of wisdom in the woo woo. And that's a quote that I've said before. People have quoted me on that, so you can quote me on that again. What I did in this book is 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 because I have so much uh, appreciation, respect for a lot of woo woo things. Is I wanted to put it to the scientific test, and I found some of the woo woo is total bullshit. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> But there is some woo-woo that does have wisdom, and that's the wisdom I put into this book. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it totally it totally makes sense. I, you know, it's interesting. Um, you said something really early on uh, when you were talking. One of the things that, that we found over and over with, with the work around flow, um, you were talking about, about they build their, they find jobs that produce as many peak experiences as possible. We find with the work that we do about flow, even if it's with organizations or individuals, the people who are best at this work um, make flow, right? Achieving states of peak performance, this most of the center of their life, they put it at the, at the dead center and they build from there, um, knowing that everything seems to spiral off of that, which is not by the way, an argument for, 
oh, we have to always have these peak experiences. That's that's not what I'm saying, but I do think we have to put them at the center of our lives is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Putting putting flow at the center of our lives, is that right? Well, put it, I mean, putting the activities that produce flow, because obviously it's very individual, right? There are flow, mm-hmm. flow triggers are, are often shaped by genetics, early childhood experience, right? So everybody's, which flow triggers you're most susceptible to? First of all, they differ over time and they differ, you know, in certain situations, yeah. but they're very, very personal. So like how to get into the state is a very, very personal thing, but putting the experiences that produce the most flow kind of at the center of your life as yeah. prior, as your central priorities. That's what transcenders do. Yeah. Tends to be a, and we see it. We don't just see it with individuals. We also see it with transcended organizations. organizations. Well, you, you're a transcender, my friend. You just came out. Anyone else in our chat room want to come out as a transcender? Put, uh, put hash, hashtag transcender in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> is that funny? Is that funny? I don't understand. Well, I say, I, I say I, things I, and people laugh, and I don't even know that I wasn't trying to make no, it. No, it, it, it's it's all right. Um, we just want you to know that we're laughing with you. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I just, I it's just my style is I tend to just sort of say whatever on my mind, and it, it tends to be funny, but it sometimes it gets me in trouble too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't noticed. I don't know what you're talking about there. Um, Talk to me about the importance of plateaus in math. Look at all these transcenders. <laughs> oh my gosh. Look at all these transcenders. More than meets. Guys, Maslow. you know, if you put, if you accidentally spell it wrong with a G in there, it has a totally different meaning. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Do you know what? I didn't even get that. Okay. Is that, is that uh, why know. you were laughing before? Did I, did I? No, yeah. not at all. Uh, okay. Not at okay. all. It's um, fine if you want to come no, out I was, as transgender. I, I, was, I, I, I was I was laughing because we proclaimed the start of a new humanist revolution. We're coming out as transgenders. Well, honestly, it's a movement, man. It's a movement. It's absolutely <laughs> movement. But there's also this this chat is open to everyone. So you want to come out transgender as well? Uh, we'll support you. We got right. Are we got a twelve. We want to be a transgender who's transgender. On. We're, we're what for is, you. We we got a twelve year old who's on asking for a definition of transgender. Did you say a twelve year old? Yeah, with yeah. Garcia uh, Rose Rosario. So should I stop? Should I stop cussing? No, no, no. <laughs> I think you're good. I think you're no, good. No, I always tell people that if it, if Stephen Kotler is involved, it is not child proofed. Yeah, so that's that's the rules the I think we're, I said I think I said the S word. I'm sorry, but um. No, they um, want a definition of transcender. Scott. I know. I heard the question. I heard what, the question. What it means. Okay. Yeah, I heard that. I just, uh, I was like, I didn't know if 12 year olds are on here. Um, okay, so uh, trans- the transcender is the person who is just quite simply motivated by higher values and, and peak experiences in their lives. So, peak the experiences, and they, like, like um, Stephen said, they arrange their whole life around increasing those triggers, and they're motivated by the B values. Um, I mentioned some of those B values earlier, justice, meaningfulness, beauty, truth. Um, you know, they're, they're, that's, what, that's what motivates them in life. That's simply uh, what a transcender is. Well, that's, Gio in here says we're on a, uh, a transcender bender. Uh, we've got someone else who's a Transylvanian as well, apparently. <laughs> that's amazing. Transcender. Do we actually have someone? We actually have... Uh, Dracula on here. <laughs> apparently, apparently. Um, well, yeah, you have for a few more questions, Scott. We have some more interesting ones. Oh, I absolutely. I I I I, I love this. So uh, here's a good one. Can a theory of transcendence be in harmony with evolutionary psychology, which is usually used to explain everything in terms of survival and reproduction? Oh, wait, hold on. I, I didn't hear what you said because Edward Admin wrote, I can only hope someday to be a transcender like SBK. Oh, Edward, it, with your permission, I would give you a hug for saying that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> virtual hug, virtual hug. Okay, can you ask the question again? And now I swear I will focus. Can a theory of transcendence be in harmony with evolutionary psychology, which is usually used to explain everything in terms of survival and reproduction? Uh. Well, that's a great question because I thought a lot about that. And a lot of my research came out of evolutionary psychology. So back, uh, many people may not know, I actually wrote a book 
on uh, on evolutionary psychology, uh, which I'm not proud of. <laughs> it's called Mating Intelligence Unleashed, <laughs> and it came out when I was in graduate school, and uh, I did it. That, I did it with. I uh, worked on it with my colleague Glenn Gear, who's a wonderful evolutionary psychologist. I'm half joking when I say I'm not proud of it. I mean, I, I think it's actually a good book, um, and it 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 brings it brings together lots of different threads of evolutionary psychology. But I quickly saw the limits of evolutionary psychology. I quickly saw um, uh, it, it focused on the parts of us, and what I really felt was missing was the the appreciation that humans are greater than the sum of their parts. And that's, that's really what I try to put into this book and really emphasize is that point. We can transcend our individual parts. So yes, it's true that we might have one module um, that, that fights for survival, one module that, you know, uh, for mating module, we have this module. Every psychologist are good at showing us all these evolved parts and bits that evolved, but they're not very good at putting us back together. Evolution is a psychologist. I've never quite put it that way, but I stand by what I just said. I actually... I like the way I just phrased that. Evolution psychologists are not very good at putting us back together. There, there needs to be a psychology of wholeness that takes into account evolutionary psychology principles, because I, I am a fan of a lot of the work being done in evolution psychology, but that takes that and then shows us a way forward to ha then what? You know, are we supposed to just rest content that we have the aggressive instinct and just say, oh, humans are just like other animals? Or can we recognize that there's a certain part to humans that are not like other animals? This is what Maslow and the humanistic psychologists really, really um, were adamant about was understanding. I mean, that's why it's called humanistic psychology. That's why it's called humanistic psychology, because we want to understand what does it mean to be a human being? Yes, human beings share certain drives with monkeys and bonobos. And even we share some things with turtles. But human beings are not turtles. We're not monkeys. I mean, we're we are kind of a monkey, but but anyway, you see, do you see what I'm saying? We're a special kind of ape. We're a special kind of ape. And what does that mean to be that special kind of ape? Mm. So I'm a huge fan, as you know, of a lot of evolutionary psychology. I think it's really kind of a found. I think it's a very good lens to think through i think if you're not thinking through that lens when you're thinking through psychological questions there's a gap i'm not saying it's the end all be all but i often feel like evolutionary psychology only deals with bottom up processes in the brain and sort of ignores the entire top down side of side of the brain absolutely that makes any I sense. Lo it makes more sense than than probably even you realize because it's brilliant so brilliant what you just said um humanistic psychologists are so interested in in what is that part of the will? See, see, see. Um, uh, uh, what, what? Can, can, how can we take responsibility for our existence? Don't blame it on your evolutionary instincts. Don't blame your existence on your evolutionary instincts. Yes, they're there, but at the end of the day, you need to take responsibility for the will that you have to be in the world, in this little space. All of us are occupy. A tiny little space, but that tiny little space can make such an impact on the world for good or bad. I won't mention any names, but you could see you could see how even just one person who has a very nefarious intention can ruin it for the rest of humanity. You've seen that throughout the course of human history, but you've also seen the opposite. <clears throat> you want to add anything on that, Stephen, or...? What do you say? Uh, Ryan, why don't you give us another question? Yeah. I thought it was really good. Cool. Um, no, I love that. I love that. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, what place do you think transcendence and self-actualization have in our school systems, kindergarten, the whole way through university? That, and, then, and then she says, or they say, this is not just teaching, but actual early implementation of transcendence and self-actualization among students. So basically, I think... You know, how can we emphasize transcendence and self-actualization more explicitly the whole way through the educational system is the question. Well, that, It's the that question was... that takes you from ungifted all the way to now, right? <laughs> Holy cow. I mean, I, I've written so much on that topic, and um, that was a 20-year like chunk of my life, that question. And 
uh, how do I answer quickly? I think schools should reorient itself to uh, to a humanistic education. This is also a vision. Maslow was working on a book on humanistic education. Maybe that'll be my next book, humanistic education. Um, but schools need to re reorient reorient itself to start treating children and stu students as though they're the humans that they are uh, with their own sacred drives and potentialities. And that in order to do that would require a big haul of the education system. It would require their standardization of testing to go away. Eight, grouping people by age would, wouldn't make any sense. Mm. Um, we would have an appreciation for, so gifted education would not be a, a way of segregating the geniuses versus those who aren't the geniuses or those with potential, but gifted education would simply be education, which would mean, which would mean giving everyone the rate in which they're currently capable of handling. Some students, and not only hand, handling, but that they're dry, driven, driven to handle. Some students um, are capable and driven to learn material four or five grades ahead but it wouldn't only mean just giving them material four or five grades ahead. It would mean helping them to integrate their great ability into the rest of who they are. So their social emotional development wouldn't lag behind other aspects of their being in essence, a humanistic education would really treat the whole child. And um, we really have, don't have a good school system that treats the whole child in any, in any, in any good way, but it can be done. I really think it can be done. Who wants to start a school with me? <laughs> Lots of people want that book anyway, that's for sure. Um, so this, this question is relevant to a lot of people in, in school, but do you think that the advent and popularity of social media allows for a hollow pyramid as identity and feelings that validate some of the basic emotional and psychological needs can now be faked or falsified through social media for the sake of ego? Oh, what a beautiful question. Who asked that question? Uh, Actually, don't have been. Oh, let's definitely pull up the name. Oh my gosh! Of course, it was Katie Sign, because Katie Sign is one of the most thoughtful, loving human beings I know. It was. Uh, it was actually it was Tracy. Williams. Oh, just kidding. Okay, that's embarrassing. But Katie, <laughs> Katie, Katie waved her hand, so I, maybe she was responding to something else. <laughs> there we go. But yeah. So anyway, brilliant question. It's tricky because I would not want to argue that the need for self-esteem is something that we want to eradicate from ourselves. What we want to do is we want to integrate it. Nothing good comes from denying core aspects of your being. That's not what this book is about. I, as you note, I argue the need for self-esteem is a need, right? It's not like I said, yep. oh, the ego is banish the ego from the kingdom or banish you know, your, your, your need for respect or pride. What you do is you want to integrate it to become a whole full human being. We acknowledge we evolved uh, to feel good when we get praise. We evolved to feel good when we, um, uh, when we feel like people like us. And you know, we're such social relational beings that self-esteem is so strongly tied you know, to the social realm. Of existence. So we don't need to get rid of that. What we do is to positively integrate that by having healthy pride, by producing something, doing something in the world that helps others, that they, something you're proud of, like, like mastery, having deep mastery of something. And, 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 and then if along for the ride, you get praise for it and it increases your, and makes you feel your, it, it flatters your ego. Well, enjoy it. I'll be honest. I'm totally giving myself permission to enjoy this moment right now of, you know, people saying nice things. Thank you. People saying nice things in the text box. I mean, of course it's inflating my ego temporarily. I mean, of course, cause I'm human. Um, I mean, I do, don't trust anyone who says they're there. They don't, you know, I have no self anymore. I am just a blobless being. That's who you're not human then. <laughs> but, but the po the point here, the point here is to be grounded and to not get caught up in it. 
That's what I talk about is don't get addicted to self-esteem. It's beautiful to have self-esteem and to have it healthily integrated. The problem is only when you become addicted to the pursuit of self-esteem in and of itself as an end goal. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. We yeah, at the Flow Research Collective, in fact, our swag, our t-shirts, it all, they all say never trust the dopamine for I love exactly it. that reason. Right. I love you, it. Like it's it's awesome, it's great, and it feels really good, but don't don't trust it, right? No, understand that it it's an artificial ego inflation, it's not the reason to like go out and buy a house. I love it. I love it so much. Like I want swag. Where can I buy it? You can yeah, get a nice swag. paper actually now as well that has that on it, um, which people have been using for a daily reminder not to get the little mini hits of ego inflation. So we'll send that, we'll send that out to everyone. I just want to uh, quickly ask folks in the chat bar to write in if they've grabbed a copy of the book. We had lots of folks who are, who are doing that already, but let's just, uh, let's see. So there's just punching the and chat. And yes, by the way, back. people, for all of you guys who are asking, we are recording this. We will release it later. Um, <laughs> Someone, Susan said, OMG, I accidentally fell asleep because SBK's voice so nice. Could someone please tell me if they mentioned they are recording this interview? I don't know if that was a positive or a negative, <laughs> a negative thing. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> our most question is lots of Europeans are tired and want to go to bed. If you're recording this, let us know. Uh, so, yeah, we are. We are. We always do, by the way, folks. We always get that question more than any. Um, but, yeah, we're recording it. We'll, we'll, we'll have the uh, replay to send out to everyone after. So if you, if you are tired or need to go to bed, you can do so. And yeah. we're going to cut together the notorious SBK highlight reel, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're seeing the word adorable, Scott, more than we ever have before in the chat bar here for some reason. Uh, that's true. That's not really a word that gets thrown my way that often. <laughs> <laughs> I should say that I'm, 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 as of right now, I'm single. So please email me uh, if you want to go on a date. He's in Los Angeles. <laughs> Uh, we could take a walk on the beach uh, three, uh, six months from now when we're allowed to leave our apartment again. Exactly. <laughs> if you like pina coladas. <laughs> yeah. We, um, so I'm just going to read this one out to you, Scott, because it's interesting. But I, I have a major problem with the concepts of selfishness and unselfishness or selflessness, I suppose. I believe we are in the very best place possible if we can't tell the difference. We treat those two impostors just the same. How would Maslow respond to a sentiment like this? Selfishness and unselfishness. Yeah, there's this person saying that they uh, they believe the optimal as if there's no ability to differentiate. That's exactly theory Z. That's theory yeah. Z. Right. So so actually that's a there's a term that 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 Maslow took from his mentor, uh, Ruth Benedict, it's called synergy. And he argued that to have a great synergy within oneself is the highest level of, 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 of motivation, of consciousness, of being in the world, is when there's no separation between self and the world. What is good for you is good for the world. Mm-hmm. That's synergy. But he then argued, what would a synergistic society look like? What would it mean for us to have self-actualizing societies where virtue pays, where we change our whole reward structure, where those, he, he has a term called meta pay, M-E-T-A pay. He argues that self, that transcenders are not motivated by money. So what we can do is we can give money to all those who need it, uh, you know, like, like poor people. We don't need to pay the transcenders as much. And their virtue will pay anyway. It's it, I don't know if transcenders will really sign up for that, but if they're true transcend, if they're true transcenders, they'd sign up for it. But um, anyway, I, I think it's kind of an interesting. He had all sorts of wa- wacky ideas about um, a, 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 about what a self actualized society would look like. But synergy was a key part of it. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's super interesting. So, uh, Geo just says here, single transcended, still in body. So you can feel free to use that for a for a dating bio or whatever. <laughs> Single transcend still in body. Can you can you Single. send me that later? Send me that later. What oh, well, yeah. I want to read it. I want to read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
what what are some of the the habits or actions or practices you personally do daily in pursuit of self actualization well well i have been working my way through the sam harris app um waking up the waking up course i've really been enjoying that i i really do try to meditate a lot i have been twice through the eight week mbsr course a mindfulness stress-based reduction course and i can't recommend that highly enough i think people who um should do a search because i know some people are doing virtual um doing virtual uh mbsr courses um my uh, I also I can give people a link later to another course uh, using cognitive behavioral therapy, mindful cognitive behavioral therapy, which is um, something I really try to work on. Uh, so many people may have heard of CB, like traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, understanding and, and really being conscious of your thought patterns, your core beliefs, um, my and 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 how your cognitive distortions are maybe getting in the way of your actualization. But mindful CBT. Is is really cultivating that mindful presence so that you don't you're not harsh on yourself about those patterns. Sometimes you can just see them for what they are and kind of see them with a bit of hilarity, and uh, and that's nice. But I also try to connect I, um, with friends as much as I can. Try to get outside, r run um, uh, as much as I can. Exercise, and moving is so important, um, and and just constantly reminding yourself of your your values, your B values. Uh, you have to constantly, you have to, uh, I'll say this, you have to recycle yourself. This is a phrase that my friend, um, my, my, the super of my building actually um, told me once. I, and I never forget it. I, I was feeling a little bit down and he was always, he's always in a good mood. He's no matter, no matter how much he's suffering, by the way, he, he suffered. He's, he almost died from a, a heart thing. And I said, how are you always so to me, you know, every morning you wish me a good day. Um, like, how can I be more like that? He said, Scott, you got to just recycle yourself. And I never forgot that. And I, and when I'm feeling really down, I try to think about that. What are the best parts of me that I can start recycling, even if I don't feel it in the moment? You know, I like it. I like it. Mm -hmm. What, well, just going right off that, another good one here. How do you think about uh, mental health, depression, or trauma in the context of self actualization? Um, well, there's there is a field called post-traumatic growth that tries to look at people who have undergone great trauma and and how do they grow from the experience in some way? Because you do send you do tend to find that a lot more people than we the psychological literature, literature have given credit for in the course of of, of the history of psychology and studying post-traumatic stress disorder a good amount are far more resilient than we have given humans credit for. There's a point Maslow wrote. He said, we, we have sold humans short and we really have in that, in that domain. Mm. We have a lot of resiliency, re, deep reservoirs of resiliency with us that we often don't realize is there until we're truly tested. A, a lot of people, you know, their worst fears are coming right now with this coronavirus, And yet they're finding the strength to still help others, to still show up for others, to still show up for themselves. And what you find is a lot of people who have had traumas tend to report increased uh, sense of their capabilities. Uh, it's something they report, a, a shift in, in what they're capable of achieving in life. Um, they see greater possibilities for others. They have a renewed sense of purpose. They have a renewed sense of um, uh, creativity. And, and things they want to put their creativity into. And they also see a shifting of their priorities. So that can be a very positive silver lining of trauma is, 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 see, is, is having an a increased sense of meaning in your life and a shift of your priorities. A lot of things that weren't uh, important to you before or that were important to you before suddenly seem trivial and, um, and you, you really can focus more. So I think that we don't have to deny human suffering. This is a big point of what, what uh, humanistic psychology was all about. We, is, we don't deny the human suffering and we, uh, we should never uh, deny that there are people who struggle deeply with insecurity and, um, and traumas um, and we ourselves may have had traumas, but we should still be aware that there are higher, higher possibilities within us and that we can integrate it into that 
core of our being. Mm. <clears throat> That's great. And I know we I know we don't want to focus too much, Scott, on on COVID uh, tonight. We have a few questions. One question related to that. That's okay. Uh, I see sighing a little bit, but. <laughs> Uh, just how do you see Malcolm? No, that was emotional. What I just said was very emotional to me. Oh, okay, so, gotcha, uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, no, big time, amazing, amazing. Um, how, how do you see Maslow's work relevant to what's happening right now, and and how? Uh, I mean, yeah, just just going off what you just said as well. How can people use now for post traumatic growth? We really can. We. This is the time we can recycle ourselves. We can really reflect on our lives, take a step back. So many of us, you know, take a pause. So many of us have gone through our life unthinkingly from one, one need to the next need, from one uh, carrot <laughs> to the next. And I think that this moment in being quarantined and being home alone to yourself you know, my prior book, Wired to Create, talks about the, the great benefit of solitude for creati creativity, um, for daydreaming, posit positive, constructive daydreaming. If we can cultivate more positive, constructive daydreaming, which was a term that my late mentor, Jerome L. Singer, um, in grad school came up with, he argued we do have other forms of daydreaming, like dysphoric daydreaming, which a lot of us are having right now, but they're also we can shift our consciousness toward a hopeful future and thoughts about what are we going to do uh, to get outside of ourselves. That's the best thing right now is to, is to get, is to do things that, 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 that transcend place and time. And that, and that could just be your thoughts. Sometimes your thoughts can transcend space and time, your imagination, mm -hmm. your, your ideas of hope for the future. Look, if, 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 if Viktor Frankl saw that people in the concentration camps were still able to have some semblance of joy, even under that environment, they still ha played games. They had, they, they, you know, when the Nazis were away, they brought out the secret games and they played them. And they said, you know, we're not going to let them tear, steal our, our spirit. You know, he has, he has a great quote about that. The last of the human freedoms is, is you know, our, our will to choose. So... In the, even under this circumstance of great, great uncertainty, choose growth. You know, you can either, Maslow again has a great quote about, we can either choose fear or we can choose growth. And we, we will have fear. We will have it. It's inevitable. But again and again, we can keep making the growth decision. Mm. That's where our flow and peak states, I mean, come in as well to kind of break up the denseness and suffering um <clears throat> yeah it's amazing scott love that uh this one's very specific but oddly interesting it's from pix does cynicism have a place in transcendence can you be cynical and self-actualized at the same time i think there's a great distinction to be made between criticism and cynicism mm -hmm. i think cynicism is not healthy for the soul and 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 i think that the research bears that out cynicism however often develops reasonably so so a lot of people may have had and grown up in very distrustful environments they may have grown up in in horrible situations you know our mind our brain is a prediction machine and our brain is wired as a weather forecaster during critical periods in our early lives. So early in our life, we if we live in an environment where no one around us seems trustworthy, our brain starts to, in those critical periods, to set the foundation for a life of cynicism. But it doesn't mean that we can't change. It doesn't mean that when our environments change, we can't revise our models of the world and see humans in a broader context. I think that it's very good to be critical. Maybe what it, maybe what, what this person meant by cynicism was being critical. I think critical thinking is very, very important. Being a free thinker, truth seeking is part is one of my is one of, I have a self-actualization test you can take on selfactualizationtests.com. 
I'll just I'll just write that into the the chat bar real quick. Yeah, you've got actually, other great diagnostics actually, Scott, on your site. Maybe people can go and check it. I just put it in the chat box. Selfactualizationtest.com. Truth seeking is one of the one of the main car core characteristics of self actualization. But you can be an open minded truth seeker without being a cynic about everyone and their intentions towards you. People at the end of the day may seem selfish when you're interacting with them and we can be aware of that fact but so are you you're selfish too you know we're all selfish to a certain extent um but we can all spot the goodness in others at the same time all these things can be true at the same time we mm. can recognize we can recognize that the person we're interacting with you know is uh has needs just like you have needs that's narcissistic of you to think you're the only one with needs but at the right. same time at the same time spot strengths at the same time look for the higher nature in others because i guarantee you it's there too it sounds like it's also it's not fully binary it's not as simple as you you can't you know you're not self-actualized if you're also cynical it's yeah it's, it sounds like it but there sick. is a so there but there is something i think that's also important because in in there and i think that, like the, this is more on the criticism side there there's kind of a fundamental and you see that there's a fundamental self-actualizers like to tell the truth right there's a realism there that i think uh i think is missing i think because because of the uh spiritual communities approach to some of these things i think uh there's a level of realism has kind of been removed for our, our thinking about what it takes for self-actualization, but that's, that's very much present in kind of the work of the humanist psychologist of kind of looking at things as they are, even if you're reframing them in the way that you need. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that, Stephen. Really seeing reality as clearly as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, it's, I think it's really, it's there in, in Frankel and everything else. Like they're not denying what's going yeah. on. Yeah. They're really seeing the truth of what's going on um, and still managing to transcend that. That's exactly, exactly right. I mean, they were very interested in, in um, I mean, Roel May took a very realistic view of evil. They, most human psychologists took a very realistic view of evil. They were very interested in understanding, you know, like Hitler or understanding these things. But yeah, you know, it's funny because we I give sorry to interrupt you and then I'll go back to it because I just want to people forget how much of an influence on that period of psychology World War II really was. Um, infused, infused, to, it's everywhere. It's so, so many people are trying to solve problems created by World War II. Mm. Super interesting. And that's a big part. So just so you know, Maslow sh shifted his whole focus of research. One day, he, he said he was sitting in a, in a car um, and he saw a parade about the war. And he was studying monkeys at the time in grad school at Wisconsin. And he suddenly hit him. And he said, I wish I could quote him from this. I think it's in the book. He said, it actually might be worth it for me to find the quote because I think it's quite beautiful. Go for um, it. Go for it. Thanks, Stephen Cutler. You're welcome. Rian's going to keep everybody covered by singing. <laughs> tap, tap dancing? Yeah, exactly. A little Irish dance. Tap, 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 um, tap, tap. I, yeah. <laughs> Happy Good Friday to the people who that's. Oh, yeah. yeah. Happy Happy Good Friday to everybody. And happy um, Maslow, Maslow. Yeah, Happy Please, Passover. Then, isn't it? It's Easter on Sunday, right? It's Easter yeah. Sunday, yeah, it's Sunday. So, yep. Maslow experienced a particularly transformative moment one afternoon shortly after the U.S. entered World War II, as recounted in an interview with Psychology Today towards the end of his life. This is what he said. One day, just after Pearl Harbor, I was driving home and my car was stopped by a poor, pathetic parade. As I watched, the tears began to run down my face. I felt we didn't understand, not Hitler, nor the Germans, nor Stalin, nor the communists. We didn't understand any of them. I felt that if we could understand, then we could make progress. I had a vision of a peace table with people sitting around it, talking about human nature and hatred, war and peace and brotherhood. I was too old to go into the army 
It was at the moment, it was at that moment that I realized that the rest of my life must be devoted to discovering a psychology for the peace table. That moment changed my whole life. And it was soon after that, that he started his good human being no notebook. So many people didn't know, but he kept a notebook called the good human being notebook. And his goal, his mission to study self-actualized people was actually his mission to study the good people. People don't know that. Wow. Great quote that. Sorry, sorry, Cole. Cole asked what page is it on. I closed the book and don't make me open it again to find the page number, but it's in the prelude to uh, part to the growth section, the prelude to the growth section. <laughs> so we got, we got guys about um, 10 to 15 left before we're going to get cut off. I got, I've got a question actually for both of you that I'm really curious on. Um, it's Stephen's answer is not allowed to be flow related, uh, but if, you could, at the click of a finger, have any research instantly be done, what would it be? Wow. I've got an answer. I got a non-flow answer. <laughs> um, and I, and I, and I, and I, okay. I, I let Scott think. And I, and I will say that uh, I had this conversation with Daniel Kahneman and he doesn't, he at least at the time, this was like three years ago when we were talking about it, he said he didn't think it's possible and he tried it. I think it's sooner or later it's going to become possible. And so what I, cognitive biases, there's so many of them, but they tend to come in categories. There seem to be categories of biases. And what I've wanted forever is to understand the neurobiological mechanism underneath our cognitive biases. I think it will, it'll kind of break down sort of what we really mean by thalamic gating and kind of basic amygdala function thing, like really early on in kind of the information processing chain in the brain is where that kind of cognitive bias, the information uh, filters go in. And I'd love to have some kind of, what is the, what is the neurobiology of it? Because it would teach us so much about how the brain processes information and gates information. So I think that's my answer if I can't talk about flow. Mm, that's interesting. I, lo I love that. Yeah. I love that. Um, well, I, I'm really fascinated with uh, with uh, with the emotion of hate, H A T E. I am really, really interested in understanding what interventions we could have that shifts perspective uh, that you have for a person. Um, and there are so many things that we hate about people that are not actually representing the person themselves. Like it's not reality. It's the representation we have in our head of the person. So, you know, it's like, you're told that like, let's say you're a, a fierce Democrat and you're told someone's a Trump supporter and they, you immediately hate the person. It's like, you don't even know the person, you know what I mean? but you hate the person, um, you know, or, and I can go down the line with examples of things where the cognitive representation of someone is what we hate, not the person themselves. And I'm really interested in knowing how we can, foster more of this sense of oneness with each other um, uh, immediately uh, and, 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 and overcome, uh, overcome these uh, feelings of, of, of hate or dis dislike that we may have at a gut level, how we can overcome that. I'd love to study that. Yeah, that's fascinating. We, that's, that's super interesting, Scott. On that um, note, loosely, we've had a, a few upvoted questions about Maslow and Buddhism, but I want to ask, what is the... Speaking of hate, <laughs> speaking of hate, yeah. now a question of Maslow Buddhism. <laughs> well, it kind of loops back, loops back a little. Um, what, what is the distinction... Hold on, hold on. Don Ledbetter, you have the best name in the world, A. B, I want to say that um, I that Roy Bausmeister was just on the Psychology Podcast uh, where we talked about that book. So um, go to the psychologypodcast.com and, and listen to that episode. Nice. Power of bad. And then uh, while you're at uh, Scott, do you want to quickly mention your Instagram as well? Well, what's the handle? For oh you? my God. Should I go, should I do the whole thing? Should I do all the, um, so Instagram, I just, I'm, I'm trying to up my Instagram game. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm like, there's enough yoga pics on Instagram. It's time for some humanistic psychology uh, thought theories. <laughs> you know? <laughs> No, I mean, I, I love the yoga pictures. Don't get me wrong. I have great respect for it. But I'm saying, you know, I, I hope, I, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is I hope there's space. I hope there's space for a, a nerdy humanistic psychologist on Instagram. <laughs> if you think there's space for it, join me. Follow me at, at, at Scott Barry Kaufman 
on Instagram. So I'm trying to get that started. Um, but uh, also um, the psychology podcast um, is a podcast I have that many of you may find very interesting. And that's, uh, and I also have a column at Scientific American called Beautiful Minds. So anyway, I, that's the, that's all the plugs. Done. <laughs> Done. We'll do another one. Scott, another. I, 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 I want to ask a quick question since we've got eight more minutes. Um, and then I'll turn it back over to you. I just, and the writer in me wants to know um, how, what was it like to write this book? Your writing changed a little bit. Your style's a little different than the right to create style. Um, and I just, from well, just a geeky writing perspective, how? let me, let me, let me, let me answer that. Um, I also want to make sure um, there was a question uh, that, that Rian, I think you were starting to ask me that someone asked and I cut you off at one point. Did I miss a question there? Uh, well, oh, we did yeah, the Buddhism let's, question. Let's hit, let's hit Stephen's ones first. I've got okay. written down, and then I've got another book-related question which we can wrap. Up. I don't want to sell anyone short. Okay, um, <laughs> be, be just because of my inability to concentrate. But Stephen, um, if you so this book is a sequel to Ungifted. Don't view this book as a as a sequel to to Wire to Create. Wire to Create. I wrote with a journalist, Carolyn Gregoire, right. who's who's brilliant at pop writing. This book is 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 all SBK, just like Ungifted was all SBK. Um, this is really a sequel to Ungifted, and and if you read Ungifted, the it's very similar level of style of writing. I think. What what do you think? I have read Ungifted. Um, yeah, I could say, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because there's definitely like you're doing more complicated things with language and transcend. Um, you write. You you. I I've always you write. You're very very clear on, on certain psychological concepts, and I don't think if you've never tried to really write about psychology, um, how easy it is to get lost in writing a psychology. How you know simple words that you would use normal in goals, for example, right? You can't just throw that out on the page. You got to you know pick one of like seventeen hundred definitions. It's much, it's much more complicated than people get, and you're very good at it. And I was just that I was, I was trying to like, oh, of it. virtual hug, virtual <laughs> hug, Stephen. Cotler. I don't know if you like hugs, Stephen Cotler. I love hugs, um, uh, but um, uh, I love that. Well, you I could also, always hug I, me. I've also evolved. I mean, my writing has evolved since. I'm, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gifted. I've written a lot more articles and things, but I will also say, in a freaky way. I feel, and this, this might sound, this is going to sound as woo woo. I feel like I was, I don't feel like I wrote this book. I, I feel like I channel, I was channeling Maslow or so. I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain it. I, when I look back on the writing process of this book, I, I would write a chapter, but not really even be conscious of what I was doing. And it, it's a little, it's a scary even in a way, but um, I, I know that, I know that sounds really weird, but yeah. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I tell a story of I wrote uh, my third small furry prayer in like a half of the book, the second half of the book yeah. in a in a really kind of nonstop flow state over a three week period. I mean, I've been working on the book for years, but the the second half of the book, I had to rewrite it and it all happened in like a two and a half week period. And I always tell people like the book did incredibly well. It was nominated for a lot of prizes and, and whatever. And I'm always like, that's amazing, but I'm not quite sure who wrote it, and I'm not sure if I could do it again. Something well, there you happened. go. A Angie Carilla, you know, she said we were in flow. So that's it. That's the answer. <laughs> totally. Um, so, Scott, yeah, let me throw this question to you, and then, uh, and then let's talk about the book for a sec, and then, and then we can wrap, I think, because we're coming up on the two hours. God, it's impressive. We got 303 people still with us uh for the whole hour and 53 minutes so thank you guys for staying on and uh nice one scott and keep keeping everyone hooked in um so yeah we, we had a few questions about maslow and buddhism um and just to summarize them i'm wondering if you can clarify or distinguish between buddhist concepts like enlightenment and no self and non-duality and maslow's notion of transcendence, I suppose, is the most, you know, directly comparable, but also self-actualization in general. In, in two minutes. Take your time. We won't get yeah. cut off. So. Wait, 
<laughs> Wait, so that was a lot. There was a lot there. So his notion of self, is that right? Can we start? Let's start with one. Well, no, it's, I mean, what he's trying to really get at is the difference between Maslow's self-actualization and Buddhist notions of enlightenment. Or no self. Yeah. Oh, well, Maslow's notion of transcendence is very similar to the Buddhist uh, notion. Um, so he was very much influenced by his East Indian colleague, U.A. Azrani. And he, there's a twist ending to the book. So the book, you, you think, I mean, I'm, I'm almost scared to give away, give it away, but uh, the twist ending is that you think you're moving up this level, levels like life's a video game in some way, and you, you have the peak experience, and then it, we're done. And what, what Maslow realized is the highest state of consciousness he called the plateau experience, the plateau experience. At which is a, a phrase that um, he he really he really uh, co-opted this term from his East Indian colleagues, and it was a state of consciousness in which you're able to be see the miraculousness in the everyday. That actually the great peak experiences don't come from the novelty, but it comes from the 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 things in your life that already are there and so the idea of non-striving is uh, as a core part of that as well but also his notion of healthy self-realization is not transcending the self it's transcending the ego which is the certain part of the self that wants to uh, defend ourselves, that wants to be seen in a positive light all the time. We can transcend the ego, still have a strong sense of self, of who we are, and, and transcend and, and, and have plateau experiences and have great appreciation, get outside of ourselves, have B values. What I try to do in, in, in a nutshell, what I try to do is I try to integrate Eastern notions of self-actualization with western notions of self-actualization um with um with with in the you know with aboriginal uh notions of uh you know uh, uh of self-actualization uh you know what what would it look like for us all to come together and integrate all these various notions throughout history and i think that's where this book gets to with theory z mm. Yeah, the, the plateau is such a great phrase, even. There's like a visual almost that comes to mind with that. Um, Steve, you got any questions before we before we wrap up for Scott on the book? I've got one just simple question on the book, but. Why don't you go ahead. Uh, I'm just, I'm just wondering. I, yeah, go ahead with yours. I've, I've got a super geeky question, and I'm going to save it for Scott <laughs> <it> offline. <laughs> I've got a very general question, Scott, which is just what do you hope for people after reading the book? I really hope this book inspires them to get out there and not only show the world that you exist, but to show the world that you existed well. I'm just going to stop there. Mm. Oh, and I want to, I want to say one thing before everybody runs away. Um, if you've been doing conversations, we've got another one coming up on Thursday night. We have a really we're going, we're going to stretch a little bit. We're doing cannabis, creativity, and flow, uh, which singer, songwriter, ex Fuji, Grammy nominated artist John Forte, Opal Tometi, who co founded Black Lives Matters, uh, Connor Murphy, our chief scientist, Will Kleindin, the head of Ohio Energetics, and myself. We're going to go deep into the topic of creativity, cannabis, and flow. It's going to be an awesome discussion. Thursday, uh, Rian, what time are we starting? What is that? We're starting at 4.30. It's going to be 4 o'clock. Uh, what is it? Thursday, the Pacific. 8th, I think Pacific, 4 o'clock Pacific time. We'll send out details and everything, but it's, uh, let me see. It's, it's Thursday, the 16th at 4 Pacific. Um, it's going to be a really cool discussion. Looking forward to that one. That's great. Is there a way? Is there, I don't know, this is a great question. Is there a way you guys can send me the chat log of every, every the whole of everything from the, the yeah whole. i think we can actually we can export it i believe oh can and you actually, really 
Yeah, yeah I could explore the chat log extended sheet. Yeah, yeah. I would love to sit down later and process <laughs> all the comments. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send it to you right away. I've actually just explored it. That's cool. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. And I hope, yeah. um, I know times are tough and I, and I don't want to deny that. Um, you know, we're all in this together though. This is the thing is what an amazing collective moment for humanity to, you know, suddenly all our, our petty fights before don't matter anymore because we're all fighting a common enemy. So let's all, let's all uh, unite. And I love you guys for spending your Friday night with us. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> thanks, so buddy. I appreciate that. Oh, and, and cool. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. No, thank, thank you, you Scott. It was always yeah. great to act with you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank, thank you, Claire, Claire as well. Bloody hell. What'd you say? Yes, so. What'd great you say? Great book. Great What'd book. And thank you, Claire. Totally appreciate it on the back end, as always. We really appreciate you. And Rhea, nice thank you. Take care. All the best. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.